Okay, so give yourselves a hand. We're so glad you're in the house to kick off our Easter series over the next few weeks. We're going to look at the, all that has happened um, from the cross, the effects of the cross, and what is still greater, what has still happened. You know, Easter is still the greatest story ever told. It is the greatest story that has ever happened. I, I'm just uh, pretending you maybe just woke up. So here we go. You ready? Easter is still the greatest story ever told. Still is. It has great effects on our lives. And, and while, you know, the, 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 there was so much in the works before that, when Jesus came, when he came, when he was born, but then he lived and died and rose again, it opened up the kingdom of heaven and these things that God always wanted to be possible for you and I. It opened up uh, these things. So God has always been, Jesus has, has always been, his spirit has always been, but it brought into focus, it brought the availability of the kingdom of heaven to us in a very powerful way. And, and I want to start off, the, the team is going to, our worship team is going to introduce a, a song to you next week, and it's going to kind of be our Easter song. And so we're launching out today from the verses of this song. And I want to read the, the first uh, verse to you because it'll lay the groundwork for where we're going uh, today. It, it, it says, the sun was darkened, the heavens thundered, for a moment death had thought it conquered. But it wasn't over until you said it's over. Your word is greater still. I, I wonder if there's something happening in your life right now, maybe a season, maybe something you're dealing with, that you have settled for it being over, but God has not said it's over yet. Have you ever been in a time where it looked like everything around you was saying one thing, but in your heart, God was wanting to say something different? And, and it's in those moments that, that really all we have to stand on is the word of God. And, and we describe that sometimes as a weak time, but what if the strongest times in your life was where all you had to stand on was what God said? You know, on Friday when Jesus was hanging on the cross, it looked like the enemy had won. It looked like that, that destruction had come. It says that even physically that, that the, 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 the skies darkened, the, 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 um, not just the, the feeling, it wasn't just a sense, but it was like all of creation was, was groaning. And even Jesus himself looked like he was, um, uh, obviously he carried death and carried sin, but it looked like it was the end, but it was only the beginning. What can God do in three days? What can God do? What, what looked one way is, is, is not the end of the story. And, and why was it fulfilled that way? It, it is because God had a plan. It is because, because God is greater than the boogeyman, if you watched VeggieTales growing up. He is the greatest, he is the best, he is the goat, the greatest of all time. But, but more than that, it was he, was he was, Jesus was the fulfillment of God's word to humanity. He was the fulfillment of his word. And I want to take you to, back to this moment. This was part of Jesus' trial and where they were, you know, trying to find him guilty and, and trying to, to, to really send him uh, to death. And so he had already been punished. He had already received um, uh, punishment and, and, and all these things. But he's, he looks broken. This is the moment when he's standing before the people and Pilate was the, the director or the, the, the government overseer of that region and he's standing and he looks at Jesus and he says, Jesus, do you, do you understand I have the authority, I have the power to, to either set you free or to, to, to send you to the cross, to kill you? And, and I just, bear with me, I, I just, sometimes you gotta read between the lines. I just think as Jesus was standing there, something happened in him. And, and then he just looked up at Pilate just to set him in his place. And, he, and he's, you know, he didn't say a lot in, the, in those moments, in those days, as he went to the cross. But this was one thing that he did. And he said, Pilate, you have forgotten yourself. Because you, you and this, was, this is my paraphrase, he didn't say, you have forgotten yourself. But, but, but he said, you have no authority unless my father gives you the authority. That, that you don't have the final word. And, and I believe that there are people here today, I believe that we all go through seasons where we feel like it's the final word. We feel like it's done, but God's not done yet. 
And the hope of Easter reminds us that his word is greater still. It reminds us that if you're facing a a health challenge or a financial challenge or a marriage challenge or a kid challenge or anything that's, that's going on, that there is one greater. And my word isn't greater. Your word isn't greater. The word of this world is not greater, but his word is greater. And this is really a, a foundational message for really believers because we're not just the people of God, we're the people of the word. We have something to go back on. We have something that is a foundation of focus and a function. And I want to I want to look at that today that it is still the greatest foundation. It is still the greatest focus of our lives. If you could focus on one thing, if it's his word. If 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 you could function in a way uh, in anything, any action in your life, it is still the greatest way for you to function a, as a believer. Uh, look at what the the uh, David actually said about the word of God in his name Psalm 138:2. He says, "I bow before you, look to your holy temple, praising your name for your unfailing love and your truth, for you have placed your name and your word over all things in all times. All things in all times. That, that means there is nothing in my life, in your life, what came before us or what will come after us that is greater than his name and greater than his word. There is nothing that we see, there is nothing that is unseen in the heavens and the earth that he has placed his word over all things and all times. Right now we're living in a world that that would call the Bible and would call the word of God old-fashioned, would call the word not relevant. This scripture tells us that we have reason to praise God because his word travels, it transcends time. It isn't just trending, it is foundational. That it isn't just something that comes and goes, it is something that remains forever. Without his word, guys, we don't have anything to build a life on. Without his word, it says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We don't hear by our feelings, we don't hear by what we see, we hear by the word of God. And that's where our very faith comes from. So if there's anything in the word that's not true or there's something that may have passed away, guys, we're up the boat, we're up up the boat without a paddle. We're, (laughs) We're in a boat up the river without a paddle. And what does that phrase mean? It sounds kind of goofy, but it means that everything around you is going to control what happens. But his word is greater still. And we have his word to cling to in times of uncertainty, but also in times of where we think we got it figured out. His word is something that we can cling to. It's foundational. And so when, we, uh, when, you, when you're wanting to study the word or know about the word, don't look outside the word first. Look at the word. What does the Bible say about itself? What does the scripture say about itself? And I want to give you three passages of scripture, uh, and and this is just the intro. So these aren't three points. These are, uh, because there are so many points in this, but, but this is foundational. Every Christian needs to know these verses. Every Christian needs to know these are, fa- these are very uh, just grassroots, cut your teeth on them when it comes to learning what the word of God is and how it has power in our lives. John 1, uh, 1 through 4, John starts his gospel different than the rest of the gospels. He doesn't just start in the, the lineage of Jesus. He goes back to the very beginning of the creation story. And it reads like this. He's actually talking about Jesus. He says, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God. The word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. He goes on. This is the same chapter in the Bible where it says that that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The message paraphrase says he moved into the neighborhood. I love that, don't y'all? So the word didn't just stay absent. It wasn't something he just, (laughs) God didn't just say something. He sent someone. He sent his word to you and I. 2 Timothy 3.16, it says every part of scripture, everybody say every. So every part of scripture. No, just the ones I like. Nope. Well, just the ones that make me feel good. Nope. The ones that challenge you also. Every scripture is inspired by God or God breathed or it means inspired by God. And it's a useful one way or another showing us truth, exposing our rebellion. Woohoo, that's exciting. Exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us up to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the task God has for us. We are equipped for every 
good work. So God didn't just say do it. God has equipped us through his word to do everything that he's called us to do. Everything that is in in front of us. And then Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active and full of power, making it operative, energizing, and effective. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. This word here is not just sword as we know it, like a sword you swing. It means scalpel, that it's a surgical instrument and what does it do it says it penetrates as far as the division of the soul and the spirit the completeness of a person and of both joints and marrow the deepest parts of our nature exposing and judging the very thoughts and the intentions of the heart wow look at what the word of god is the word of god has been given to us to to do these things and then out of that today i i want to to Talk about just some specific areas that it is still greater, that it is still uh, available to us to, um, to active. To, it says it's active and it's living, that it's breathing, but what does it do uh, in our lives? And a couple of things we just got to understand in the very, like very foundational uh, about the word of God is that God has placed his word over all things. Why? Not just because he's on an ego trip, but because everything we need is found in God's word. Everything we need is found in God's word and through the power of the Holy Spirit, through his presence. Emotionally, physically, and spiritually, if you've got a need, God's got an answer. It's found in the word of God. And I I know we're, yeah, 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 but do you really believe that? Because where we go when we need something tells us where we have confidence as it being the answer. Proverbs says that his word is like medicine. It's medicine for, for my very soul. You know, the good thing about this is you don't have to have a referral to get God's word. You don't have to wait for the insurance to kick in so that you can get the stuff that you need. And the refills are unlimited. It's like when you go to Red Robin and you order the fries and they say they're bottomless. I can only eat one basket of fries, but I still order extra fries because they're extra. They're, 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 it's, it's over, it's more than enough. You, you've been at a time in your life where you got more than what you could handle, more than enough from the word of God, that it overwhelmed you in his goodness, that it overwhelmed you in its supply to you, that, that when we look to the word and we really trust in it, man, there is no greater medicine for your soul. There is healing in his word. There is redemption in his word. There is salvation in his word. There is challenging in his word. Oh, it gets quiet. Oh, I just love the Lord to challenge me. I do, because there's more where that comes from. And he didn't just point to something to be better at it. He comes and walks this thing out with me. The power of our relationship with the Lord. And so, so we, we really need to, to ask ourselves, do I believe in this ultimate authority of the word in my life? I'm not asking you, are you a believer? I'm not asking you if you believe the word of God is good. I'm asking you, do you believe that the word of God is the ultimate authority? Because just like a king has the ultimate authority in the kingdom, God has set his word as the ultimate authority in the kingdom realm. And so that means it has the final word. That's how we can bank on it and say, everything else around me may scream this, but if God has not said it in his word, that's not what I'm banking on. Until he says it, then I'm still gonna serve. What has he said? And and I'm not gonna... Let my feelings tell me what God says. I'm not going to let somebody else tell me, well, this is what you need to do. Everybody notice that, that the, sometimes the people around you are experts at something that they've never lived out. It's like, you know, you got a two-year-old or you've never had kids, but you can tell me how to raise my teenager. Just wait till you get you one. Everything you thought you knew. How about running a business? Somebody that's always worked for somebody else, they're able to tell you how to handle it, how to do it. You should do this. You should do that until the weight of it is on you, until you handle it. Here's what is so good about his word. Jesus didn't just say it. He lived it. And he took on the weight of everything you and I will ever handle, and he conquered, and he won. 
And, and, and what was part of the it is finished? Obviously, his tetelestai, when he declared it is finished, was, was he had finished his assignment and his purpose. But he also set a foundation that he had completely fulfilled the word and what he was sent to do. And what did it do for us? What does it cause to happen in, in our lives? It causes, first and foremost, a foundation. The word of God is still the greatest foundation for our lives. Jesus was teaching the, the Beatitudes and uh, so much other, so many other things. He was teaching, um, the, it was the Sermon on the Mount. And so he talks about all these issues of life and the things that people were dealing with. It was so completely relevant and how to walk out uh, a life with God. And then he gets to this part about how important his word is. And this is uh, Matthew 7, 24 through 27. He says, these words I speak to you are not incidental additions to your life homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundational words, words to build a life on. If you work these words into your life, you're like a smart carpenter who built his house on solid rock. Rain poured down, the river flooded, a tornado hit, but nothing moved that house. It was fixed to the rock. Fixed. You can always tell what part of the country someone's from by the way they say fixed. And the way we say it around here is fixed. What's your... What's your life fixed to? What, what, what is the foundation of, of your life? What is your life anchored to? That's what Jesus is saying. He says, but anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey, it's, uh, obey it's, and doesn't obey, it is foolish like a person who builds a house on the sand. When the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash so Jesus paints this picture of us. He gives us this great metaphor for the two choices, the two places that we can build our life on. We either build it on the sand or the rock. There's no other options. Jesus doesn't offer a hybrid model. He doesn't offer, well, sometimes you can do it on this, sometimes you can do it on that. You can base your life on the word of God when, like here, but, but, but not over here. And then he says that, that it's not about adding additions to your life. It's not just something to, to make you feel good. It's not just something so that you can have a better life. See, the word of God isn't just something that tells us about God. It is God. Now, I'm not talking about the, the physical Bible is, is God, but just the scriptures that I read to you at the very beginning, it's inspired by God. It was written by man, but God breathed. Written um, uh, by human beings, but, but they were inspired by the, the hand of God. And, and I love this. Jensen Franklin says this. He says, when you can't hear God, read God. Open up the scripture. Well, I just don't know what God is saying. Stop waiting for somebody else to tell you what God's saying and open the Bible for yourself and allow him to speak to you. Listen, I'm a, I'm a visual learner too, and I'm a, I'm a uh, verbal learner. I, I, somebody just tell me. Somebody just tell me how to do it. And so instead, God wants to not just tell you, he wants to show you. And what Jesus made a possible, what Jesus made a possible, he made it a possible. <laughs> what Jesus made possible, he is the incarnation of the word. What does that mean? He is the revelation of what the word of God is. And, and so when we look to it, when we give it that authority in this place in my life, all of a sudden it opens up something about not just about how to live life. Does it have instruction? Yes. Does it have wisdom? Yes. But this is God himself revealed to us. I don't want just a good life. I want God life. Because what, will, what is good sometimes will change. And, but, but, but do we want what trends or do we want what matters? Do we want what works? And we can say, well, it's ancient or it's old-fashioned. You're right. And there's a reason for that because it's been working since it was given. There's a, there's a reason for it. And so when we come back to that, that's a foundational level. And, 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 it, and it isn't flashy a lot of times. It's not trending. You know, when, when uh, you, Amy and I built a house a few years ago and people came over and they, they would say, man, nice floors. And, man, that's a, that's a really cool door. And, and that's really neat. But you know what? They never said, Michael, I just love this foundation. This concrete, that's good concrete right there. They didn't, they didn't go, this place is built right. They never said that. Well, when you're picking out a car, 
buy a good, a good man, I just really want a good car. You want a good looking car. Nobody ever says that frame right there. Whew. Like that's good frame. When I was picking out my wife, I never said, baby, your skeletal frame is, man, it is so fine. I said other things were fine. Still do. But not, man, your, your skeletal structure, man. So, so I get it. The, the, the underneath is, is not always flashy. It's not always the first thing that we go to. But Jesus says it's the most important thing. And here's the deal. All of us have cracks in our lives. All of us have things, and you can either consider the foundation or you can get the caulk gun and you can try to fill every crack so that it looks good on the outside but do we want to look good on the outside or do we want to be right and not as in right and wrong but be righteous the way he designed us to be and every life has it the thing about this is at first when Jesus is setting up the scenario there's no storms both houses look the same both houses have windows. Both houses have doors. Both houses look identical. And, and, and then, and then what, what, what happens? It wasn't when everything was going normal and the sun was out and everything was good. It's when the storms came. And, I, and notice this. He didn't say if the storms come. He said when they come. So we read and we study the word of God and we build our foundation on the word of God, not to avoid storms, but to endure them. They're coming. If I were to ask you, who in this room has a neighborhood that never experiences any storms? You don't, because we all experience them. Who has a life that has never experienced a storm? But storms tell where our foundation is. Who are we building our lives on? And, and I just want to remind you today, his word is still the greatest foundation. It's the greatest place to build a house. It's the greatest place to build a marriage. It's the greatest place to, to build your finances, to do it God's way. It, it's the greatest way to raise your kids. It's the greatest way to, to, to build a life. And, and, and if there are cracks, don't, don't, don't run to Home Depot and buy the stuff to fix the, out the outside. Consider the foundation. And, and stop walking into your house telling people, well, if we tilt our heads, it's everything straight. If you just look like this, I mean, how goofy is that? Sit around your table. Let's have dinner. Everybody lean to the right. I mean, that's the left. <laughs> know which way is your right and left. Lean to the right. And as long as you hold it like this, everything's good. And I just want you to, I just want you to think for just a second. Let's think outside of our own lives and our own selves. Why would we tell the world to put their trust and their confidence in something that you have to change the way you look to say that it's upright. And while we sometimes fool ourselves into thinking, we've just settled. The house is just settled. When the house settles, it cracks. You get these things called pop-outs. You have them in your house, I have them in my house. If you never know what they are, they're the places where the sheetrock pops off the screw or the nail, and you have to patch those suckers, and it's a pain in the rear end. And some of you never knew what was happening to your house, but now you know, so you have a project. You're welcome. But, but it's just like, if you'll just lean like this, we'll see it clearly. But that's not the way God designed us to live. That's not the free life. That's the leaning. And, and, and when we lean, when we, we look different to the people who are looking at us, and, and what they're seeing, we put our confidence in our, our, our what we put our confidence in and our trust in. And so he, he is the greatest foundation. And when the enemy comes, when the storms come, guess what? Your shutters may rattle. The, the wind may make the house seem like it's going to come tumbling down. But guess who's standing in the end? The storm passes, the sun comes out, and you are still standing on what you have built as your foundation. Jesus says, you got, can't just take these words as mere additions in one ear, out the other. Build your life on my word. And when you do, it will stand the test of time. Why? Because he has placed his word in his name over all things in all times. And sometimes all you've got is the word of God to stand on. And that's okay. 
Jeremiah, put that scripture up there for him. This, this might just be for one person today, but I just want to encourage you, don't give up. Don't stop. I know the storm's noisy. I know that sometimes it's, it's fearful and it's like, man, I need to, I've got to hunker down. And, and, and hunker is, you know what that means. Anybody know what hunker is? You're raised in the South. If you weren't, I'm sorry you weren't raised in the South because we have words like hunker. And, and it's our own language. But, but it's a place you, you don't have to, to be in fear. You can be secure. You can be safe. And then guess what? Your house is safe for your family. Your house is safe for others because you have built your house and your family on the word of God. He says, your words are or what sustain me. Sometimes your feelings don't sustain you. Sometimes that what, what this world is offering us, it, it is not sustainable. But what is sustainable is his word. It remains forever. It has always been and it will always be. It's the greatest foundation that we can build our lives on. And then the next thing is it's our greatest focus. If you can focus on anything, make the word of God your greatest focus. What you focus on becomes your friend. You become friends. You might not even like your friend. You got friends you don't like. You're you're acquainted with them. Some of us, we put up with, they hang out, but but, but they're really not, they're they're, they're really not what we want. We've just kind of settled in a way for some of these things. And what we do is sometimes we become more acquainted with things God didn't say than the things he did say. We become friends with, with, with things that God didn't say about my health because that's what somebody told me or, or somebody just said what, what they knew. But instead of taking that back to the word of God and saying, I, I just here's a newsflash for everybody. You get to decide what you're going to focus on. You really do. Sometimes we think, well, I just can't help but focus on this. But you do. You get to, you have the power. Tina Turner had it right. You've got the power to choose what you focus on. And if you don't choose what you focus on, your mind will choose it for you. Anybody got a crazy little mind up there sometimes? The society will choose it for you. Sometimes our engagement with with different things, that becomes the front and the focus. But I want to show you what what happens. Um, Everybody, I'm holding this. And if you have a physical Bible, you can hold it up for the illustration. We're going to... we're going to, I'm going to show you something that's very simple that helps us know about, um, understand our focus. Here, here's God's word. And, and God's word, if you're here today, you, you believe in God's word, at least to some degree. You appreciate God's word. You, you believe, okay, what he says is, is, is it's important. And you've been amening about God being the foundation. But this isn't about God being the foundation. This is about God being the focus of your thoughts and your words? Have you set it as the focus in your life? And, and if, uh, go ahead and put, put your hand up. You just put your hand up like this and just move it to the side, the right or the left. So let me ask you something. Can you see your hand? Yeah. I mean, I can, I can see the word of God over here. You can see your hand. Now, now, now move it over to this side. Can, can you still see it? Yeah, but it's not your focus. Now move your hand in front of your face. Now it's your focus. Now, can you see the things that are around you? Yeah, you, you still see them. It's not like you don't see the person over there. Just kind of nudge them right there. You just you, know, you say, I see you. You can, you can see them over there, but your focus is the thing that you've set your, your eyes on and, and your focus. So here, here's what this looks like. Many of us, with great intentions, we look at the Bible in light of the world. So the Bible is a part of our life, but it's peripheral. It's in our peripheral vision. Instead, God wants us to look at the world in light of the word. So I make decisions about the world and my interaction with the world based on what God says. This this is about focus, y'all. And and so many times we're like, cool, the Bible's great. It's it's over here. I was raised in church. I mean, think about sometimes the way we defend that. I I know there's a scripture, John 3, 16, that God, for so long, you know, he, you know, that one. And and, and so he... (laughs) There are certain things we, we become familiar with, and, and, and that's great. I'm not, I'm not saying that that's not important. I'm just saying that maybe that was the beginning and not the end. Because what happens with all of our lives, focus changes everything. And you'll begin to focus on your feelings, and guess what happens? The Word of God is over here. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but your feelings come first. And we'll tell the Word of God what we feel 
and we'll begin to build our foundation on that. Yeah. We'll, we'll, tell, uh, we'll begin to tell God, we'll, we'll build a whole worldview on things that God never said. Instead of making sure our focus is, God, what did you say? You have the final word. It's not over until you say it's over. I want to challenge you. I would say that most of you in the room read the Bible from time to time or you read it daily. But we're not instructed just to read the word. We're instructed to study the word. The study means that, that we take it from, I'm just, uh, for instance, you, you come on Sundays and, you know, it, I wouldn't be a good pastor or a good leader to you if I hadn't studied the word and prepared something today. I don't want to just come and read the scripture. I, I want to come and show you something that I have studied. But, and this is part of what God does. He brings us corporately. We celebrate. We study his word. But this isn't the stopping place. This isn't the full meal. This is just to get your appetite stirred so that this week you can dive deeper into what God wants to reveal to you through his word. But most of us, like, I grew up in church, and I kind of banked on what somebody else told me that they heard from God. And it took me a while before I learned that God wants to reveal himself to me, not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a son. Because you're a daughter or a son. You, you belong to him. You're in relationship with him. God doesn't want to speak to me in a greater way than he speaks to you. We're all his children. But there are just some that, that, that take it a step further than just reading the word that I'm going to begin to study the word of God and, and, and what it says. And, you know, this is all through scripture, the principle of studying and meditating on the word. A really important place that uh, Amy actually talked about last week in uh, God's word to Joshua. I, I want to read this to you. This was before Joshua led Israel into the promised land. And he instructed Joshua, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Study the word of instruction. Study the word of God. David said it like this. He says, I have hidden your word in my heart. What does that mean? It means that it's the very center of who I am, but it's also I prize and I treasure, like I hold your word. It, it is hidden in my heart. Hiding means that it's safe, that no, nothing or no one can take the word of God that I have hidden in my heart. It's studying. It's taking it to a, to a whole nother level. And then the word he uses there is meditate. Now, Eastern meditation is to escape. Biblical meditation is to engage. Eastern meditation means I want to escape into uh, mindlessness or, 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 and, and I just want to find my center. Listen, if you ain't looking at Jesus to find your center, you ain't never going to find it. And you might find something, but it ain't Jesus. Because there is one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy and to deceive you. And, and we're not supposed to be escaping. We're supposed to be engaging with our faith. And so when we meditate, here's a, a great, what I feel like is a great, and if you don't think it's great, then you should. Um, this is a great way to understand meditation. It's, um, it's the same word or understanding as ruminate, and it's how cows eat grass or eat food. They ruminate, and, and it means they, they would eat the, the grass, they would chew it up, they swallow it, and then they throw it up again in their mouths. They chew it up again, they swallow it, they throw it up again, they chew it again, even smaller. I mean, you're talking about blending that thing down. Swallow it, and they keep doing it over and over uh, again because they want to get every bit of nutrients out of the food. That's what meditate means. Not just hearing a verse and posting it because it made us feel good and it sounded good. What does God say? No, I mean, post it because it made you feel good, but, but go deeper than that. Study the word, meditate on the word. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? How do you want me to live this out in my life? Thank you that your word is living and breathing. And it's not just something to hear preached. It's something to receive as something that is, is the very food for my soul the medicine for my soul. And then I dive in and what's really cool about this is, is that it releases nutrients in a, in a cow's body that actually helps them process and break down everything that they consume. 
And so here we are, we're, we're people that sometimes we don't know how to deal with what's going on or how we process through things or, or, or information or the word of God or the season of life that we're in when God has given us the answer already. Everything we need is found in the word of God. Everything we need, a processing tool, understanding, wisdom, application, and that's where it moves, where it's not just a foundation that I build my life on. It's not just something that I'm going to focus on. And can I just, will you study the word this week? Will you just, will you take a deeper look? One of the greatest things about being a part of a church is a church family. We want you to meet Jesus, but we want you to dive deeper in your relationship with him. I love Sundays, but what about Monday? What about when the rubber meets the road and you got to live this thing out? We want you to have fellowship and relationship with the Lord. That means His Word is what I focus on. His Word is paramount. And there are so many. Listen, we are so blessed as a society and now with technology. And man, you and, 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 and then the, the, the group of people that you have to live life with. I mean, there's classes, there's Bible studies, there's things that you can do on, on your own. Thank you, Life Church, for making you version available to the whole world where we can find a Bible study on anything to dive in and study the Word of God and not just hear, I love devotionals, but not just hear what somebody else thinks about the Word, but what is the Holy Spirit, God breathe, what is He speaking and saying to me? And then don't just get up from that where that's really cool and make your post on Instagram, but, but how do I walk this out in my life? How is it the Word of God revealed? And here's, what, here's why I'm spending a little time on this and challenging with this, because some of us Most Christians, I would say, have settled with hearing the word from somebody else, but not hearing the word for themselves. And if you ever want to know how to walk out the word, don't just settle for what you hear somebody else say. I am so honored that I get to stand in a place like this. I mean, this is our favorite thing to do, to share the word in any environment. I love doing that. I love digging deep. I love studying and hearing what God's saying to me and saying to to, to our church. And I love that. And I love releasing that. But don't let that, don't just stop that. If you're a life gator, don't just hear the word. Be a studier of the word. Like that cow. And if you don't like that image, then (laughs) something else. Just lean in to his word and study the word for yourself. So many translations that make the Word of God easy to understand. So many ways that we can study the Word of God and get to know who He is. Not just learn about God, but get to meet with God face to face through His Word. And then it, it is the greatest way to function in your life. It is the greatest function in your life. God didn't give us His Word as a lounge chair. It's a sword. Think of all the ways that we've talked about how the Bible describes itself. It's always action. And James says, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers of the word. Don't just be one who sits and listens to what it is. And he said, and I love this because he describes it. He says, if you, if you are one who listens to the word and, and doesn't do the word, you're like one who looks at himself in the mirror and then walks away and forgets what you look like. And you're like, come on, man, that's not very nice. But that's exactly what it is. We'll open to the perfect law. We'll open to what the word says that 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 when God you really you need to do it this way. You should think this way. And and we we see that, we read that, and here's here's the the the, the kicker. Most of the time it's not that we don't know what to do. We just don't want to do what it says to do. It's an obedience thing. But when we have submitted unto the authority of the word, if we really believe that God has the final word, if we really want to bank on it being our foundation, our focus, then it will simply be the function how we walk out our lives. And I I used to think, when I was kind of starting out, I used to think that I studied the word of God so that God would do things in my life. You know what I mean? Like this exchange thing. Like, God needed me to read his word so that he would move, that, that he would do things. But but it's not that way, it's relationship. God already knows his word. He gave it to us so that we would know how to live life. There is not anything that you are facing right now that is not found in the word of God that he will show you and reveal to you, this is where you find freedom. This is where you find life. This is where you find function in your life. And there might be somebody here today that you are in this place of, man, Michael, I've been doing that. I've been speaking the word. I've been believing the word. I believe everything that you're saying, but I am still, I still am not seeing it yet. You keep 
speaking the word. You keep standing on the word. You keep believing what God has said. You don't, don't, do not be distracted by other things. Well, I just, I think I need to try something else. You keep standing on the word of God. And I promise if you don't give up, you're going to reap a harvest. In this room right now, how many of you have been in a season before where you trusted and you had to bank on God's word and it didn't happen in your timing, but you just kept listening to the word of God and what God said and eventually you reaped a harvest. Raise your hand if you've seen God do that in your life. Look at that, hands all over the room. And God is no respecter of person. If he does it for me and all of these people, he will do it for you in this season. Do not give up. Be encouraged. You keep standing on the word of God. The storms may come. Your shutters on your house may be shaken. But when the storm ends, you will be standing firm and strong and remaining on the word of God. And you go, well, I, I've, got, I've got cracks everywhere. Put the caulk gun down. Look at the foundation. Build where he's asked you to build. Stand firm. And I promise, I promise, he, he promises that he will watch over his word. Here's what I want us to do today as, as we respond. I know that he has declared, David says that he has set his word in his name over all things and all times. But have you? Have you set his word as the ultimate authority? Is there, is there something, a conversation that's happening right now that's trying to talk you out of something that God has said? Maybe there's something going on that, that you are, you're banking on something that God never said in his word. Maybe you're, you're up against something right now. You're wondering, man, I don't even know what what God thinks about this or how God, uh, how God would say, what would he say? What would he, what, what, what would he want for me in this moment? And now you're just recognizing it's time to lean in. It's trying to lean into what he says. What is he, not just what is God saying in general, but what is God saying to me? Have you taken the word of God as casual or is it serious? Maybe today, it's been over here. It's been something you refer to, but it's been more of an addition. Now it's time to start hiding it in your heart. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? We just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? What is he saying to you today through his word? Where is he challenging you to submit to the authority of the word in your life? So Lord, here we are, our hearts before you. God, we're your people. And we wanna be people of your word. God, we thank you that it is still greater. It is still the greatest foundation that we could have in our lives. By today, where the word has been something that we think of every now and then, or maybe even considered as precious, but it's not personal. Lord, today we choose to set the word as the ultimate authority in our lives, to be our focus. God, I thank you right now that you're bringing into focus the word of God in our lives, almost like a scope where we're adjusting the sights so that we can focus in on what you've said more than our feelings, more than what we're seeing around us. Let your word have the ultimate authority. And then God, where we're looking for wisdom, I pray for right now the person that's looking for the function and looking for the action, the step to take and how to move forward in something. God, I thank you for your wisdom. It's found in your word and that it is our function and that we're not just people who hear it, but that we practice it, that we walk it out, that it's simply a part of who we are. Thank you for sending your word to heal us. Thank you for sending it to free us, to correct us, to equip us, all the things that it does. We declare today that your word is over our hearts, over all that we interact with, God, that it is over all time. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, as you just continue to pray and receive from the Holy Spirit right there, I just want to ask you the most important question that you'll ever be asked. Today, do you need to meet Jesus? Do you need to enter into a relationship with him? The Bible says that that's salvation and it only happens by us admitting that we needed him, to, that we need him to be our savior, that we need to receive the, the work that he paid on the cross. And it's the only way that we get to heaven. There's one way, one truth and one life. 
And I believe you're here today because he wants to enter into that relationship with you. And maybe you've prayed a prayer before. You could be a member of a church and maybe you read the Bible, but you would just say, Michael, today I need a fresh start and I need to recommit my life to him. It's time for me to take him serious. And I want to make him the Lord of my life today. We're not going to embarrass you or call you out. We're not going to make you say anything or do anything. This is about you and the Lord. I just want to know that I'm praying with you. And if today you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, you want to commit your life to him for the first time, or maybe commit again and you need a fresh start, will you just slip your hand up and put it right back down? Thank you. You want to join these others? You slip it up, put it right back down. Just a few more seconds. Ready to come home, man. Just need a fresh start with him. Thank you. Way to go, buddy. Just a few more seconds. Christian's praying. Don't leave here today without things right with God. He loves you. He wants this relationship with you. I'm going to give you some words to pray in this moment. You just pray this in your heart. Pray it with all of your heart. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus. Jesus, I believe you're real. I believe that you really did come and you lived a perfect life on this earth. And then you died a complete death. On the third day, you rose again and you beat sin and death and hell and the grave and that all that separated me from God. Thank you for bridging that divide. I could never get to you on my own. Thank you for coming to me. And I believe that one day I'll see you face to face in a place called heaven. Thank you for making that place for me to spend eternity with you. And I thank you that this relationship with you, that it's real, that it's living and breathing, that it begins right now. I thank you that it begins again, a fresh, fresh start is happening today in me. And I thank you that your word is greater still. And I set it over my life, over all things and all times. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.